Hey folks, uh, I'm here today with Caroline Elliott, author of Existential Kink, uh, who I've known for many, many years. And uh, I only discovered recently that she had become a legendary uh, figure uh, in the <laughs> kink world. So, so Caroline, how did we meet originally? Yeah, well, so the first I remember hearing of you was um, I wandered into a really cool party and I asked the people throwing the party uh, how they all knew each other. And they said, we met on a social forum network thing organized by Daniel Pinchbeck. And I said, OK, cool. I guess I got to find out more about this. So I checked out the Evolver website and I checked out the Reality Sandwich magazine. And yeah. I started to get more familiar with you and your work and your book, 2012 Time for Change. And also, um, yeah, 20, I mean, it made it it was so giant in Pittsburgh. We were all <laughs> really, the return of, really... 2012 the return of Ketzel Bottle. Uh, yes. No. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. That was the, yes, I'm getting the subtitles all wrong. It made a big impact on us. And um, yeah, and the, but the very first time we met, I think we had organized um, a conference for the Evolver Network in 2012. And you came and visited the conference. Yeah, it was awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, were you already into this material back then or is, it, or is this something you figured it sort of worked through later no um definitely came about later so after um hmm, let's see so around 2013 i think i started getting involved with one taste which is the notorious X cult i hear they're gonna have a netflix expose soon <laughs> And um, I, it's, it was a fascinating. I want, I want to tell people a little bit about what that was. Yeah, I, I knew, I, mean, I never did any of their workshops, but I was friends with uh, Nicole Daydon, I guess, uh, for a while. Yes. So uh, One Taste was both uh, magically wondrous and a <laughs> sort of darkly nefarious place to be. Um, One Taste was centered around the teaching of a practice called orgasmic meditation which sort of a simplified Zen version of Tantra, where one partner uh, strokes the clitoris of another partner in a very sort of defined way, very lightly um, with, there's like a whole specific protocol with like gloves and lube and cushions and a timer. <clears throat> and um, so one taste used the erotic energy, the energy of pleasure, of orgasm, as a metaphor for all of life and all of communication. And it was a very, very deep teaching. Um, and one of the things I learned there was, so Nicole, the leader, would always say that the truth is sensational. And that's hard to argue with. Like when you're talking about like deep embodied emotional truth, you know, when you tell somebody that you love them for the first time, like there's a, there's a bodily response to that. So um, I got interested in the relationship between the response of my body to truth. Um, and of course, I was also really exploring, there was this notion in one taste that it was possible to explore the range of sensation that one received as orgasm or as pleasure, with the idea being that most people have a very, very small range of sensation, both in actual sex and in their lives that they will receive and be like, yay, I like this. And then there's like this whole other spectrum of sensation outside of that little narrow range where people are like, no, I don't want this. Got to get this to go away. I hate this. So the idea is that um, you can have a deeper, broader experience of orgasm in sex and a deeper, richer experience of pleasure and surrender in life if you deliberately practice expanding that range that you are willing to welcome and embrace and say yes to. I noticed in the book, you talked about the orgasm meditation. You were saying that even within that very specific, tiny little practice, like people would be, would be uncomfortable in certain ways that they were touched or not touched. 
Um, and then you were saying that that could also be converted into like a positive energetic charge in a way, if if you got away from those, you know, kind of uh, rejection and, and acceptance modes in a way. Yeah, absolutely. So like, for example, so the practice was very specific, just like teeny tiny strokes on like the upper left hand quadrant of the clitoris. Just like the most That's sensitive still, Yep, the most sensitive part. And very, very light, very, very slow strokes for the most part. But still, you know, for some women, for some people, that's uncomfortable. It, would, it wouldn't feel good. And so the practice was pretty cool in that it included, you know, people asking more specifically for what they wanted. Um, so like asking for somebody to move or try a different stroke or a different pressure or location. But there was also off, often the invitation to just practice, just see, like, if you don't like the way that something feels, can you practice dropping your story about it? Can you practice just surrendering into and opening up into it instead of like, yeah, resisting? Contract, instead of contracting, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was one clue for you um, in terms of what became sort of the, the whole concept of existential kink. It was a major clue for me because one day I was in a guided home. So one of the founders of practice is a beautiful man named Ken Blackman, who stroked thousands of clitorises all over the world <laughs> and really deeply understood the practice. And he was giving a guided home and I was being stroked by somebody. And he gave one of these instructions to, you know, just open up wider than you ever have, like beyond your you know usual conceptions of things and I I did and I had this experience that was like absolutely you know transcendent psychedelic totally sober just high on pure sexual energy and it really revolutionized my experience of life it made it I mean it occurred to me like wow I can completely change my relationship to the sensations that I'm experiencing. And instead of having them be painful, they can be pleasurable. Was there also, because your book obviously talks a little bit about SM, BDSM practices. Was that something you were exploring personally or was it just sort of metaphorical, allegorical in a way? Yeah, good question. I mean, I think I've probably explored it much more in metaphor and allegory in my mind than I ever did <laughs> personally. I mean, I did, I have done some stuff, but I mean, I'm certainly other people have done much more. But just knowing that there was a whole community of people, a whole thing out there in the world where people would undergo experiences that normally humans seek to avoid, like being in chains or being hit or you know all of these experiences and that they would undergo them in such a way that um they set up containers they set up agreements they would give themselves um a chance to experience it as play to experience the pain as a kind of play and a kind of intimacy and i just was thinking about that and i was like wow how i wonder if it's possible to engage my relationship with life in such a way that all of these things that are happening that seem so painful and terrible to me, what if, what if I could create a container and experience those as play and experience those as intimacy and as opportunities for surrender and pleasure instead of just as, um, you know, poor yeah. me being tortured. Yeah. Oh, yeah. goddamn, another horrible thing out of this happen to me. <laughs> Um, and, um, so then, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I definitely, I mean, I, I, I sense that a lot of people are reading your book and getting really excited about it. I mean, I don't, I don't know what you, what, 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 you know, what your sales figures are or whatever, but I've seen people around talking about it and reading it and so on. Um, and I definitely felt, um, resonant. Like I felt that personally, uh, and it, to a certain level conscious, but your book maybe amped up, you know, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm still sort of, I think growing with the with the way you're expressing it like um how yeah sometimes we sabotage ourselves or destroy ourselves or do things for ourselves almost because we want to feel this like kinky pleasure as sort of this 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 consciousness which outside of our individuality is just exploring its full range of potentiality is that kind of the idea yes definitely sort of um the notion that uh, all manifestation is God playing hide and seek with God's self. 
and God is one kinky ass motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's like, um, you know, we can, there's always that option to stay in feeling like, wow, I'm just like this poor ego that's so put upon. And um, I mean, everything will certainly seem to confirm that, like, no matter how lucky we are, we all eventually, there's old age and death awaiting us, like the Buddha noticed. So the practice of beginning to like open up and say like, hey, perhaps there's something, you know, my psyche is larger than my ego. Perhaps there are some other parts of me that are just really having a ball. And can I get on the side of those other parts, those shadowy repressed bits of my being? So somebody might actually on some level be enjoying being like broke and like having like a miserable experience, like not, not able to find money to, to live properly and stuff like that. I, I certainly did. That was certainly my experience that I talk about in the book. I was, and of course I never, like until it fully dawned on me, I would have been so offended if somebody had suggested that to me. I would have been like, what are you talking about? I'm miserable, this is horrible. But when I, I was really, it really interested in that question of like, what is the relate, like the truth is sensational, you know, so, so, um, in, interested. Your, in your own life, you'd been like, like what kind of work had you been doing? You've been looking for different jobs or. Um, oh yeah. Well, I had gotten, I'd spent the first seven years of my adult life getting a PhD, PhD in critical and cultural studies. And then um, I hated academia and I didn't want to be there anymore. So what can you do with an English degree? Well, whatever you can do without one. So I was working sort of like freelance copywriting jobs as scraping pennies together, living on the couches of friends. And uh, I didn't have money for food. So I had to go stand in line at the local food bank and it was freezing cold. And I was just like standing there one December morning being like, wow, this sucks so much and I'm also curious you know I've read all this Freud I've read all this Jung I know that it's possible for human beings to have desires that are outside of their conscious mind's knowledge it's like I wonder if some part of me really really likes this I wonder if this right here is the fulfillment of something for some unconscious part of me and I just started getting really curious about that and I just kept paying attention and like seeing um you know the sensations that would arise in connection with the poverty that I was experiencing like the anxiety about how am I going to pay for this how am I going to pay for that am I going to be stuck here forever like really dropping into those sensations as much as possible without story um and seeing what was there and particularly also experimenting with exaggerating the story so I would exact I would I would play with like you know because my conscious mind thinks okay people should want to pay me lots of money for my services but if I turn that around so I was like doing the work of Byron Katie which I highly recommend it goes really hand in hand with this um, if I turn that around to nobody should ever want to pay me anything for my services I found that I had this like whoosh, this like rush of like oh my god that's so hot like my whole body just responded to that and when I noticed that I was like oh my god no wonder I can't get paid no wonder I can't make money I am so turned on by the thought of being devalued so um I decided, all right, well, so clearly the part of me who wants to be devalued is deeply satisfied by this broke couch living food bank going <laughs> situation. So I don't know how to change it. I've been telling myself that I want to change it. I want it to be so much better. I don't know how to do that. I'm just going to relax for a while in whatever this enjoyment is that is present, whatever this fulfillment is that's already occurring. And I did that. I just started to see, and it was weird because the more that I just concentrated on that, just concentrated on like, hey, I don't have to understand it. Nobody else has to understand it, but I'm actually getting, I'm deeply fulfilled. Like I can't explain it to anybody. I must be a crazy woman, but 
this is my deep fulfillment and I'm just going to let myself have it. And the more that I just dwelt in that energy of feeling the fulfillment that was present in the great romance of my being totally devalued by society and just like undesired and unwanted. <laughs> it was really weird because it's now suddenly instead of seeing myself as this like, you know, poor, wronged, put upon, misunderstood intellectual who is just completely, you know, devalued by society. Now I saw myself as like, I'm just a freaky, fulfilled lady doing what I'm doing. And um, there was something magnificent about that. And from that energy, all sorts of inspirations started coming towards me. And um, it was kind of crazy because within three months, I had changed my whole life. I was, I went from making like, you know, like a thousand dollars a month to ten thousand dollars a month. I went from living in Pittsburgh to living in Bali. It was just like this, it was this like dropping into this huge um, portal. So what, what, so actually I, uh, what actually happened in those three months, just out of curiosity, not to go too deep. Yeah, I mean, I mean, sure. You just, well, so you um, your attitude, like your, your inner compass had shifted and how did the outer world then kind of like respond to that? Yeah, so uh, it happened in a rather mundane way. So it was as if like me being in this energy of fulfillment just made myself, just made it possible for me to see options that I, I was like completely blind to before, like utterly and completely blind to. So for example, the, I was doing coaching at a time, at the time and getting like poorly paid for one-on-one -on -one coaching. And I had the idea like, oh, hey, I'm a writer. I could write an online course and I could sell that. And that's what I could do. And so it's not like, I mean, billions, of men, not billions, many of people have thought of this. This is not like the most original idea ever, but it was like completely outside of my vision of possibility that I could write an online course and learn how to sell it and set it up and everything. So it was just like following these simple impulses that previously had, you know, we're just outside the realm of my identity. What, what was that first course about? The first course that I wrote was called Thrill, and it was actually about building an online audience through writing viral articles, which I had done because um, I had written an article called Seven Traits of Magical People, and I had gotten like something like it was like 50,000 people in a Facebook group based on that article. And then my clients came from people in that Facebook group. So it was just teaching other people how to do that, essentially. Nice. And then it just sort of scaled up from there. Yes. Uh, so what do you mean by um, having is evidence of wanting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's an axiom that I use to investigate. Um, what unconscious fulfillments might already be present in my life. So the idea is that whatever is going on in my life, there is some unconscious part of me that is being fulfilled in relationship with it. So the challenge is to surrender my ego enough to get on the side of that part of me that is having what it wants in whatever the experience is. You know, so here's an example. Um, I, <laughs> I said something that a lot of people found offensive on Instagram last year. I got like thousands of people telling me what an evil monster I was. Um, well, what, what was it that you said? Yeah. Well, what, yeah. What, what, well, what the essence that? of it... <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll, I'll say what I was what I was trying to express is that all people are indigenous to the earth and deserve respect and access to medicines. But the way I said it, I think was a bit rude and confrontational and hit buttons, which was I said, hi, I'm indigenous too, which I am. I am indigenous to planet earth. My people were originally in tribes, just like everybody else's. But anyways, people... <laughs> 
people lost their shit at a white lady saying, hi, I'm indigenous too. And I knew that it would be controversial, but I didn't realize like how controversial it would be. And of course, anyways, so it blew up my entire business. Like this, um, I lost hundreds of customers. I lost tons of revenue. I had people like demanding that Wiser stop publishing my book. I had um you know my best friend and business partner broke up with me it was hard it was wow. very very painful and just, i can definitely just from see one state just from one statement on instagram one well i mean it was it was a whole post um it was a whole thing that i said but yeah it it was i was you know it was a clumsy effort to express a non-dual truth yeah and um and I was feeling feisty. Mercury was in Aries. I think I did like hashtag social justice, hashtag whatever. Yeah. And I basically was like trolling liberals. And um, oh boy, they did not like that. <laughs> so anyways, um, I learned my lesson. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm still actually still thinking about what the lesson is. Yeah. But anyway, so here I was well, having this whole you know, like... There, yeah, and there, there is like, uh, we are in a sort of situation where... Um... Like people are feeling that they can't say what they actually want to say or what they think because if it goes off the sort of, you know, so then everybody's in this sort of marketing mindset where everyone is just trying to like create this perfect front for the, you know, other. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's that's very unhealthy. And that's also, I think, yeah, there's a weird way between the way that, you know, liberals and, and conservatives have switched places, whereas, you know, the right, the right wing are now defending freedom of speech and hating on the FBI while the liberals and the, 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 you know, the quote unquote left who used to defend freedom of speech and, and hating on the FBI are now pro FBI and kind of like suspicious of, uh, you know, freedom of speech and kind of promoting censorship. Uh, so it's actually a very confounding circumstance. I, I hope that the, you know, quote unquote left uh, remembers to toggle back, you know, to, uh, allowing mm -hmm. for expression you know e even if it's because you know whatever people you know as you know as somebody who's interested in psychoanalysis and so on you know what you resist persists what doesn't was it what isn't allowed to be expressed is just going to descend into the unconscious and, and find another avenue of expression mm -hmm. yeah. absolutely yeah so um so i had this so just sort of to complete the little story here um yeah, this experience of all of these people being really upset with me, very distressing, like, basically, there was no level on which my ego was winning in this situation. And I, of course, I teach this work, I teach, you know, this axiom of exploration, having this as evidence of wanting. So I had to get really serious with myself and ask, okay, Carolyn, where is it? Where can you find the part of you that wanted this to go down? And, you know, gradually I found there was this part of me that found it really, um, was really attracted to being seen as harmful, as evil, as bad, as guilty, as responsible for the suffering of others. And that part of me was unsatisfied being seen as a nice spiritual teacher lady <laughs> was very very unsatisfied and wanted to like really be seen as like just terrible and so I got that experience for myself and it was deeply fulfilling I got to be seen as this incredible wretched villain by people who had previously <laughs> respected me um and it was also deeply freeing, too, because it took me out of, um, you know, I, I can't say that I would do it again or that I necessarily recommend it, but it did clear out from my field everybody who was there projecting on me that I was always going to be their nice, compassionate mommy figure who completely agreed with their political views and grievances, whatever they were, and just like blasted that out. And it made room for um, me to find the people that I actually truly connected with and vibed with, which opened the portal for um, me founding the Sleepover Mystery School, which has been like the absolutely like the most beautiful creation that I've ever experienced. So what, what is what is this? What's the Sleepover Mystery School? 
Yeah, so the Sleepover Mystery School is a nine month program. We have four live in-person immersions in various locations around the US. And it's in the tradition of the Eleusinian Mystery School as filtered through the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and Thelema. Um, crossed with, you know, eternal teenage slumber party, naughty, sexy vibes. So we do crazy intense ritual magic. We do guided sex magic experiences. We do, um, we have adventures and gorgeous, crazy things happen and people like forge profound connections. We just took about 25 people through this experience. So we just finished our first one. And it was, um, I mean, I'm still like, there were synchronicities that occurred in doing this that have like pretty much like permanently blown my mind. <laughs> like, I don't mean, <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, conclusively linear time is a lie. <laughs> and so anyways, it's been very rewarding for me. So what I'm trying to say is that this deep rewarding thing um, came out of this giant big mess and <laughs> um, and and allowing the, the part of myself that wanted to be seen as wrong and bad and terrible and was so you know my conscious mind is so so afraid of being seen as wrong and bad and terrible that giving myself that taboo experience and deeply receiving it was actually really freeing. So how did the, uh, how did the, that, this experience engender this mystery school? Yeah, well, very directly in that um, I was so devastated. There were so many people who had previously been friends with me, been close to me, who would no longer talk to me, like were completely, <laughs> they were just disgusted by me and the people who <laughs> so how do I say this um but the people who really really got existential kink at a deep level like at the level that I understand it they were coming to me and saying like Carolyn you did like we understand what you were trying to say we just want you to say it more, say it, like, do it, do it, express it in poetry, express it in ritual, like express this non-dual truth. Um, and so basically it was like a sorting the wheat from the chaff kind of thing. Like the, the friends who could really be um, on my team in bringing forth what I wanted to bring forth suddenly became very clear. And I became, well, how do I say this? I was actually vulnerable for the first time in a long time. So for years, I had been a fancy, rich, internet, spiritual teacher lady. And I had my old friends from growing up in Pittsburgh. But I really didn't have barely any new friends because everybody was my student. And so these people, so um, it's Layla, Layla Bernard and Lucy McNaught are the organizers of Sleepover Mystery School with me. And they were my students. They came to my previous retreats. They came to my, um, I did an existential kink life coach training program. And they were the ones who were still like totally down and totally like ready to play and create with me at a time when like other people were turning their backs because I had disappointed their fantasy of who I was so um yeah it made room for me to so <laughs> it's hard to tell the story because it's all jumbled, jumbled together but like I said I was actually vulnerable I was actually in the market for new friends oh. like I <laughs> needed people yeah. to really see me and so the people who could really see me and feel me um became closer to me and, and then a creative current moved through us that generated this thing that is so so beautiful i'm eternally grateful for it i would get canceled 50 million more times for it. <laughs> um you have a family right do you have a family am i aware of that like, yeah you know? yeah i'm married to um well he used to go by josh lee he now goes by david lovewell i don't know if you remember him he used to have dreads back in the day he was in our revolver group in pittsburgh so David and I are married and we have um, a three-year-old daughter named Eleusis, Lulu, <laughs> and um, he has two sons from his previous relationship. So I have stepsons too. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so let's see, let's take some other quotes from your book, which I, as I said, I was just been enjoying so much. 
Uh, let kinky pleasure be its own reward and don't worry about trying to fix your life with integration. <laughs> Can you extrapolate on that a little bit? Yeah, so I've taught this process many times to people. And the tricky thing about it is, is it is a transformative process. And I have to be honest about it when I teach that. But also sometimes people hear like, oh, so um, I'll just get off on this thing and then I will get the thing that I really want that is way better than and so I'll get rid right. of this shitty stuff that I hate. I and think it's like, and so they'll- Exercising they'll, they'll, an example, right? Like uh, I think in the book, yeah. yeah. Yes. So then they are not approaching the practice in the attitude that it needs to be approached, which is like this super deep surrender. So like, it, like doing it with this- um, sort of attitude of like, well, I don't really like this thing, but like, I guess I'll pretend to like it so that I can get rid of it. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. that's just still the ego control mechanism. But, but I mean, there's still, still this idea that the process would lead to people, you know, getting this thing that they want in some way once they've surrendered. I mean, how, how does that then come about? Well, yeah, so that's or just, just the experience. They don't really want Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's just been the experience of many people that I've taught this to, and it's been my own experience again and again, that when I can get to the point of, um, deeply relaxing with what is present and deeply feeling the fulfillment and the pleasure and no longer resisting, like just super opening up. And it's, it, it really is an identity shift because, um, the ego maintains its sense of separation through not liking. So I can, I mean, think about it. If there was absolutely nothing that we, we had any objection to, how would you know where, <laughs> where anything ended or beginning? Like it's, it's only through this sense of protest and resistance that the sense of separation is maintained. So, um, Let me, how do I say, I want to tell it in the way that it's a useful metaphor. Okay, so one, one way that I think about it is it's the process of an alchemical marriage. So there is, when the deep surrender happens, there is actually a union and a fertilization that happens where the conscious mind fertilizes the unconscious mind with the conscious mind's desire. But in order for that fertilization to actually happen, you know, repeating affirmations is not enough. Usually visualizations, not enough. All of these things that people have been taught really aren't what does it. The one way we can imagine it is that the unconscious mind is the a beautiful lady. And she is just creating everything that is already in our experience. She is giving birth to it. It is just like blossoming out of her and the conscious mind is like a knight and the conscious mind has a goal in mind he has a quest he wants to go accomplish something he wants to change something he wants to make something happen but he can't do it if he doesn't have the power of the lady if he doesn't have this generative power moving through his quest is going to fail so in order for the alchemical union to happen, what has to occur is the knight, the conscious mind, has to get down on his knees and completely praise, completely surrender to the lady exactly as she is, exactly with what she's already doing, not telling her that any ounce of it should be different in any way, just completely being like, I'm here with you. I want to love you and celebrate you as you are. And that that deep surrender of like the masculine conscious part of us allows the alchemical marriage to happen where the conscious mind and the unconscious mind can finally come together. And like I said, when that coming together happens, there is a fertilization. The unconscious mind gets planted with the seeds of what the conscious mind all along has thought would be great to experience. And those, um, those seeds get planted in the unconscious and they get birthed as synchronicities, as opportunities, as 
new things happening and sometimes birthed very quickly. Yeah, that's so fascinating. Beautiful, beautiful metaphor. I love that. Um, I mean, I was kind of, um, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I mean, I wrote recently about like Joe Dispenza a little bit and Tony Robbins and kind of like um, some of my issue around kind of like part of the new age, which is very much about, you know, kind of like uh, you create your own reality, you know, kind of, um, you know, and you sort of address this in the book. You, you talk about you know, sort of the question of, okay, but what about all these people who really can't make a positive shift for themselves? Like, you know, kids in Ukraine who are getting their legs blown off or all these people in Pakistan who are losing everything in the flood, you know, and so on. I mean, how, how does this type of um, kind of uh, understanding apply to people who are, are in such, you know, averse circumstances? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, a profound question. Well, so the thing is, is that it's always not just our personal unconscious that's at work. There's also the collective consciousness and the collective unconscious that's created this world that we have where war is a thing, where scarcity is a thing. So we all certainly are within that. Um, and I guess my general answer to it would be like, First of all, we can, I can notice like in my own situation with like the poverty stuff that I was dealing with, I could notice like, okay, this seems to be a personal hang up that I have. There are other people who grew up around me, who went to the same schools, who did the, and they're doing fine. So clearly something is like particularly going awry with me. So there's that. The... Yeah, these deep, deep collective problems that humanity has been going through. So the main little piece that I would say is that even somebody in a terrible, dark situation generated by the collective still can have a more empowered, magical, beautiful experience of life if they manage to figure out how to get into this you know, how to get into surrender and um, praise instead of being in that, you know, the attitude of grievance and resentment, it may be a thousand billion times justified and it still is a weakening energy that doesn't open up to whatever, you know, so for example, like not that this is analogous to um, war, but just that it's, it was a hard experience the hard experience that I was talking about with getting canceled. People have committed suicide under those conditions. Like I could have just been like, well, you know, nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. Guess I'll shut up. Like I could just feel like super resentful for people who turn their backs on me. I could get super, you know, in any adversity that we're confronted with in life, we can use that as a reason to get Hateful, or we can use that as a reason to expand the context of who we are, to expand our love and our surrender. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I guess, um, I mean, I, yeah, you also mentioned that maybe, I mean, um, people choose difficult circumstances, maybe in one lifetime or something, we just don't know. I mean, but that you have to be careful, obviously, because then that can lead into a very detached kind of view. I mean, I, you know, I, I loved actually the part where you talked about, um, Many of us intelligent, spiritually inclined folk have had a profound realization. There's no reason to do anything at all. Uh, you know, you said it just doesn't matter. We're all just fluid, swirling emanations of an endless non-dual reality. So in an ultimate sense, it doesn't matter whether or not you pay your bills, find true love, save the world, raise a family, or get enlightened. There's no rock solid, non-ideological dogma, dogma free pure reason to get in shape, go to the dentist, have a baby, build a nonprofit foundation, or anything else. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's, that's interesting. I mean, um, what is that? And so what does that mean for people when, when they've integrated that, that they're free in a way? Is that kind of the idea? Well, yeah. And if you're doing anything, you're like, do it because you want to do it, not because you should or you have to or I mean, so uh, <laughs> it's yeah, I mean, it is the ultimate truth. Emptiness is the ultimate truth. Um, and of course, like the Buddhists always emphasize, you might as well focus on compassion if you're going to be aware of profound emptiness. Um, 
<laughs> just because, <laughs> because why not? <laughs> like, you know. But what about, for instance, the, um, you know, the climate emergency? Like, you know, I mean, one, one reason that I started the Evolver Network was my dream of kind of like creating a network where we like, you know, shifted out of materialism and it's all these like transformational practices that we didn't like, you know, we didn't, we lost our interest in accumulation of like goods and money and stuff like that. Um, and, and, you know, yeah, it looks like the climate emergency is, you know, going to get worse and worse over the next years, you know. I, I guess my my concern with this, you know, um, which is, even though I completely agree with what you're saying here, is how, how do you motivate people? You know, is there any reason to try to motivate people collectively to, uh, I mean, I you know, I have friends in, in London, for instance, who created that movement Extinction Rebellion and have tried to get all these people organized to, uh, you know, do very unpleasant things like civil unrest. I mean, um yeah i mean i'm just curious how your philosophy kind of jibes with these other situations you know in a way yeah it is a fascinating question so um you know you having that ambition to get people to do something about climate change sort of like a quest right like a, a goal a chosen ambition of sorts <laughs> I don't know if I have it anymore in the same way, um, but um, okay. Yeah, but once once upon a time you did, and in pursuing that chosen aim, you met all sorts of people. You had you know various adventures. You learned things. Cool stuff happened, right? Yeah, um, and if you had simply sat and meditated somewhere that would have been cool too <laughs> yeah yeah so, so, so what you do is kind of present people with this sort of choice in a way like a like a wider range of choice you know in terms of how they can follow their their you know kinky and unkinky desires is that is that kind of it um yeah so i I think it is generally more useful for human for humans <laughs> to approach questions of how to live life from an aesthetic point of view rather than a moralizing point of view. Because moralizing, um, it just locks us into these like dramas of oppressed and oppressor, rescuer and helpless one, you know, it, it's not, it's kind of, it just, it gets a little, it's, gotten kind of super repetitive it's gotten kind of super dull so i think it's more interesting to to ask oneself like what would it be beautiful for me to do what would it be um you know inspiring or opening to do not what should i do or who needs who do i have to rescue or anything like that because it ultimately, like, they're, <laughs> it's all, we're all just, like, uh, dancing dream characters in the mind of God. So I think beautiful dreams are, je are definitely my preference. I like dreams of love and harmony. I like those much more than, uh, you know, violence and torture and things like that. So I do, I follow the advice that the sages of... <laughs> of my tradition have passed down about this is how you create beauty and love and symmetry around you. You do these things. So, um, I mean, that's my choice. And of course I'm on this, I have a mission too. My mission is to um, teach alchemical literacy, which is I want to empower at least 10,000 people to really know how to do this move of making the unconscious conscious creating this much wider bridge of communication between the conscious and the unconscious minds, which is essentially the work of magic, especially in the way that Aleister Crowley talked about it. So basically bringing magic and mystery to the forefront of culture. That's the mission that I choose for myself. I love it. That's, yeah, it's fun. It keeps me busy and, yeah. you know, get to feel like I'm doing something. But is there... <laughs> <laughs> you know does it matter like ultimately no because i am the nearest flicker of a dream yeah, um it's and so are we all 
but it's like, well, apparently I'm in this level of the dream that it moves a little slow. Um, seems like I have the option to do stuff if I want to do it. Yeah. So it's, it's a creative canvas. And um, yeah, so I guess I, I just think that there is strength in taking, in letting that choice be an aesthetic choice. Because when we have, when we frame the choice about what we will do with our lives in moralizing terms, it, it tends to come as like some sort of like, well, I have to do this or I have to do that. I have to save the children somewhere. I have to do like, no, you fucking don't. Yeah. Like they're just happening in in the great dream of the universe. That's you do it if you want to, if you truly want to, if that's like what true anyways, I could go on and on. Very, very interesting. No, I mean, um, no, because I, I often struggle uh with a lot of um you know, I, I would say anger uh, and frustration because I feel like people take the easy way out and, you know, make a lot of money doing things that to me feel um, like they don't have a positive benefit or even have a negative benefit, you know, for the world. Whereas I feel that if you try to do the, you know, the things that you feel are better for the world, uh, you often get, you know, knocked down and humiliated and projected upon and so on. So yes, you get rewarded. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the that's the reward of virtue it has ever been thus and why is that uh how would you know that it was the virtuous thing to do if you were not punished for it interesting could you explain if, a little bit more? it was completely easy if it was if you were completely materially rewarded for doing it what would be virtuous about it that's interesting all right fair enough but um, what about feeling all this like vicious anger at people who, in my mind, like take the easy way out and, you know, go for the money and have like these incredible lifestyles and so on, you know? Oh, yeah. Tell me more about this vicious anger. What do you want to do to them? <laughs> I mean, I mean do you want, um, want to like bang their heads against walls until their like brains burst no, out? of course not. Well, I mean, maybe. But I mean, sure? more, more, more... <laughs> perhaps i don't know but i mean you know more like it just feels like we're we're, we're squandering our uh, human opportunity to create you know something that would be better for everybody you know because people are so focused on their own self-interest you know mm -hmm. yeah so people are focused on their own self-interest and that's why we are squandering our opportunity to do something much more beautiful for everybody right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like we go back to like the Iroquois Confederacy, you know, which was, you know, what the U.S. Constitution was kind of based on, you know, they, they were the native people living here. And for instance, they believed in like the equitable distribution of uh, goods and resources, you know, so it wasn't a situation where somebody would amass a huge amount and everybody else would be kind of deprived. Uh, and um they uh, also the people who were the chiefs or the leaders were often the ones who had the least because they would distribute anything they got through the community. And that was actually how they earned kind of the rank of leader. Whereas here in our society, it feels very disturbed because, you know, we um, see as virtue, you know, in a sense, virtuous or culturally, uh, we give a lot of credit to those people who are able to amass a huge amount of resources, which usually means that they have done things like, you know, shaft workers of, of money or, um, you know, destroyed ecosystems or privatized the public goods, you know, privatized things that could be common property, like the commons, like. Yes, the villains are, are materially winning. Yeah, materially winning at the, at, at the, at the you know, the, and the problem is in that process, they're also dooming, you know, a, a lot of other people like, um, you know, let's say Pakistan, for instance, at the moment. Yes, and I totally hear you. Yeah, the doom and the uh, like enormous iniquity and imbalance is really staggering. And so I guess, like to me, the question becomes. So I guess what I'm what I'm hearing, Daniel, and I'm hearing like, and I feel like, like we're in a session all of a sudden. It's beautiful, though. <laughs> right, what, what's that? I feel like we're suddenly in a coaching session all of a sudden. But okay, go yeah. for it. <laughs> yeah, well, if you if, if I may, yeah, please. So I I feel like um I feel like your gorgeous compassion 
is really entertained by like wanting the drama of the material world to be really, really super important and real. But how do, how do I say this? I don't want to diminish that at all because it is in a way, in a way it certainly is. But I guess what I want to, what I want to get to is like a way for you to be present with that, present with the great drama. Like I agree, it's, it's, um, it's a terrifying situation that the world is in. And yet I'm curious, is there a way to be present with it that um, is more playful than angry or resentful? I certainly try, you know, um, but. Um, well, let me ask you this. I feel a lot of I, grief also in a way, yeah. Yeah, well, grief certainly, yeah. Well, so you mentioned the self-interest and I guess like the self-interest of the the big villains who are, you know, despoiling the earth and jeopardizing so many other people. I guess the way that I just always take it in my practice is whatever I seem to be upset with anybody else about, I find that as, an, as a very interesting thing to get curious about in myself. So if I were in the same situation, like you're describing, like feeling really angry at the plutocrats and, you know, I'm judging them like, wow, they're serving their self-interest at the expense of everybody else. I would get curious, where is, you know, how is my resentment or my anger serving the self-interest of some small part of me at the expense of the whole rest of my being? So like, and and for me, if I was answering that question, um, it would be like the more anger and resentment I get to feel, the more sense of moral superiority I get to feel. Like I can see like what you're doing is wrong. I fucking hate you for it. And because I can see how wrong it is and how evil it is, I get an identity of being the one who knows better. I don't feel that's my issue. I mean, I don't feel yeah. any moral superiority, nor do I even feel judgment, actually. Um, it's just more of a disappointment almost in a way, because um, I totally understand. I can understand what drives, you know, people, you know, to take a job that pays them, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars so they can go to Burning Man and all the fancy goods and gallivant around the world. But actually what they're doing is something that, you know, has a, has a negative, you know, from my perception, a negative value, um, whether it's, you know, mining cryptocurrencies at a great energy cost or, you know, making television shows that demean and degrade, you know, the, the consciousness of the mass, the masses and so on. Um, and I think, you know, part of me is I could see that I could have done all of those things, you know, I mean, I, I would have been smart enough to, you know, put on a kind of like manipulative marketing apparatus and, and figure out how to, you know, advertise some some junk or something. Mm -hmm. So in a way I feel mm -hmm. frustrated because, you know, I, I could have set up a life where I didn't, you know, have such somewhat constrained economic conditions um, if I had you know i've been sort of trapped by my own like you know moral principles in a way in some areas and in other areas um i didn't always act you know in ways that were morally proper you know that well, that totally makes sense like the disappointment the frustration the feeling like geez i could have made different choices i guess what i would just be curious about is i mean are you are you satisfied with your principles as they are and your adherence to them like are do you want to change anything about what you're doing or do you want to like continue enjoying it that's a good question i'm gonna i'm, I'm mull on that caroline <laughs> okay i mean yeah and and i don't mean to uh like it, it is just the question because like i can see there is a deep satisfaction, like a deep gift that you have given yourself in adhering to your principles the way that you have. Like there's something precious that you gave yourself there. 
Right. But don't you also feel that in some ways we do have a kind of, um, well, I mean, I, I understand the emptiness perspective, but, but I mean, uh, look at a society like Tibetan, you know, the Tibetan Buddhist society, which very much operates on these types of principles that you're espousing. Um, I mean, that was a very uh, collective or let's say communal cooperative society. You know, if you, I mean, they, they were, and you know, you know, there was this Dalai Lama, there were lamas, you know, but they weren't really, you know, the, the material wealth was really just an expression of a spiritual purpose uh, in our in our in our modern society. I mean, this is even what somebody like um, Julius Avola, you know, writes a lot about that we've like we've flipped it, and so we see material accumulation as somehow a mark of um, you know something good, you know. Uh, whereas for these other cultures, that, that would have been totally rid ridiculous. Um, if that makes any sense. Yeah, well, it does make sense, and uh, like I completely agree with you that like uh, Western culture, whatever we've, I mean, it's it's nutty town. It's no way to have a culture. It's essentially a non-culture. It's like <laughs> it's not actually. Um, uh, so I hear that you're like there's like this deep curiosity you have about like what's it going to take to for the culture to turn into an actual culture that actually reveres spirit and understands that matter is an expression of spirit and not that it's like the end all be all of everything yes mm -hmm. yeah i mean because i think that would be the only way to reckon with um these otherwise kind of run runaway destructive forces which we, we may have already missed our off off ramp uh you know in terms of uh interrupting that you know um, yes certainly i mean we it's uh i guess something that interests me a question that interests me is um what is the purpose of evil like does evil have any purpose or is it just like this pointless thing that we should be angry and resentful at? Like, is the only purpose of evil to attract grief and anger and resentment? I mean, I, I guess I've heard some Buddhist perspective that really isn't evil evil as such, that evil is just ignorance in various forms. You know. uh, mm -hmm. what, what's, your, what's, what's your thinking on that? Well, I guess my... My general inclination is to hold it in such a way that the evil that I experience in my direct uh, field, so there's the evil of the that the collective is doing to itself, there's the evil that people are doing specifically to me. Um, like, for example, I was sexually abused as a child. So like that was a very deep encounter with evil that I've had to reckon with. Um, for me, I've come to see all of that as um, as something that compels me to shift my identity, shift my perspective from what I previously thought it was. Um, and the example that I always think about with this is, have you ever seen the TV show Westworld? Uh, the new one or the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the first the first season was particularly good and the first two seasons. So like, for example, there's this android lady, she's going through the motions of her life and she just gets, she continually encounters this evil dude in black who's raping her, murdering her again and again and again and again. And weirdly enough, he's actually doing it because he loves her and he wants her to be actually sentient and actually like aware of who she is. And gosh darn, the plan works. Eventually there's like so much um, trauma and memory of pain that something in her wakes up and says like, I am larger than this character that I seem to be. I am much more powerful than this little limited character that I seem to be um and then <laughs> more adventures ensue but I guess I just see it as that is what um consciousness is doing to itself like there's these extremes and um 
we are certainly at this very extreme point in our experience on earth. Certainly there were other times, other cultures that were much more wise and harmonious. And we've gotten ourselves into this deeply, extremely imbalanced, depraved state where there's, you know, rape and plundering of psyches, of resources, of people all over the place. And um, to me, it's like the evil just keeps coming out of some, <laughs> because <laughs> in a deep, deep sense, out of love, that's trying to wake itself up, like the dreamer in the dream that keeps thinking that it's separate, that keeps thinking there's somebody to save, there's somebody, there's something to get, there's something to win, just keeps coming at itself and being like, really? You, do you want to keep holding that? Because as long as you do, you're going to suffer, honey. So keep holding it. Here comes more suffering. Here comes more suffering until finally you're like, I give up. <laughs> I, I, I just like go into like, you know, God is just this like freaky, perpetually orgasming, perpetually breathing, laughing, murdering, birthing singularity. And, uh, well, so that's why I like mystery and magic <laughs> rather than activism or anything, mm. because I, I guess my theory, if 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 I can imagine any way that our culture renews or becomes wise, becomes harmonious and beautiful, to me that happens through a uh, a renaissance of of mystery and magic and people getting in touch with the fact that they are in fact characters in a dream that God is dreaming and not um, not super serious whatevers. <laughs> because we've all been taking ourselves so seriously. And it's like, and this whole notion that, um, you know, why are people so obsessed with material wealth? Well, the more material wealth and power you have, the better you can ensure your own survival. Why are we so obsessed with ensuring our own survival? Well, we've had thousands of years of first dogmatic religion in the West, you know, Christianity is saying you're going to go to hell, probably, or science, secularism saying there is nothing after death. There's just you just disappear. So people don't fucking want to die. But none of that is true. That's just not true. It's like there's a continuity of consciousness, which is what all of the mystery schools, all of the shamanic religions Tibetan Buddhism, you know, Egyptian stuff is all about the continuity of consciousness and the adventure that happens when we die. And that there's really no reason to fear death whatsoever. In fact, the cultures that were most successful throughout history at maintaining their independence from being enslaved or colonized were cultures that were super excited to die in battle. Um, so it's like, there's a way in which, um, of course, like when I think about modern America, like, of course we're enslaved. Of course we have these like, this sad, you know, consumer wage slave situation. Of course we're being poisoned by the government. Of course we're being controlled by pro propagate. Like, of course, because we are all unwilling to die. Like we are all terrified of it and think that it's a great tragedy and we'll do anything to prevent it. And oh no, people might die from a virus. We have to shut down all of society. Like the level of insanity yeah. that comes from the fear of death renders us slaves. Yeah. So um, anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Um, that's been like an hour of chatting. I'm so happy to re-encounter you, and I, I love what you're uh, what you're bringing. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really fantastic. Um, and I, I hope we get to hang out some more and, and chat more. I'm gonna look into your uh, okay. mystery yeah. school. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, mystery school is fun. Thank you so much, Daniel. It's been wonderful reconnecting. All right, cool. Well, we'll talk soon, and uh, have an amazing day. <laughs> okay. <laughs>